Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Tuesday, April 30th, 2019 Market Watchers Live Show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinland. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Let's get into the market today. We saw some uh, earlier weakness, especially on the NASDAQ, but the market is trying to come back. We got the Dow Jones Industrial Average currently down 27 points, the S&P 500 down seven, the NASDAQ getting hit on a relative basis uh, much harder, down 77 points. The Russell 2000 also bouncing back down about eight points at this point. Ten-year Treasury yield down about two, almost two and a half basis points, back to 2.51%, just simply consolidating here in a pretty tight range between 2.50 and 2.55% over the past week or so. Volatility did rise earlier today with that move lower in U.S. equities, but uh, it has or has fallen back off that earlier high, currently around 13 and a half. Communication services getting hit uh, pretty hard, mostly because of a drop in the internet stocks. Internet had been on absolute fire throughout much of April, but we are giving back some of those gains, pulling back close to the 20-day moving average. The big reason, Google. We had Google, Google's earnings out after the bell yesterday. Revenues came up a little short, even though they did beat on their bottom line. You can see the stock getting hit very hard, down more than 100 points today, a little bit below the 1,200 level, and testing the 50-day moving average. Tonight after the bell, Apple comes out. Apple also putting a little pressure on the computer hardware space, currently down 2%. Apple has fallen back about 4% since hitting a high a week or so ago. It is you know, uh, gyrating back and forth right near that $1 trillion market cap level. Also, a group getting hit today, gambling stocks. They've been doing pretty well as in uh, the month of April, as you can see here, but they are pulling back about 2.5% today. MGM reported and MGM getting hit to the downside, but on a relative basis, MGM has not been one of the best performers in this group, so I don't take a whole lot from that negative report there. We'll see whether or not the gambling stocks can hold that rising 20-day moving average. Okay, Aaron, welcome back. Um, it's Tuesday. It's the last day of April. It's hard to believe we are getting ready to turn the calendar into the month of May. I know. All of our monthly charts are going to go final, so all of those signals are going to be etched in stone at the end of the day. So it'll be interesting to see what comes up on those monthly charts. I have a few I'm looking at. Are you anticipating any big changes? Uh, you know, when you have when you look at the whole monthly setup, not really. I mean, as far as our signals, I mean, nothing's really that close to changing. But it's always nice to see where where are we seeing acceleration or where are we seeing deceleration on some of these indicators. And you know, we had just accelerated so nicely uh, earlier, and we did have you know we made those all time highs this month. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out on those monthly charts. Yeah, the S&P 500 and NASDAQ yesterday closed at new all-time highs. Uh, Dow and Russell 2000 have been lagging, especially the Russell 2000 small caps. But we have seen over the past week or so a little bit of a move back to the upside on a relative basis in those small cap stocks. And, of course, the bull markets always like uh, to have some leadership from the small caps. So that's I'm watching that pretty closely. 1,600. We actually closed yesterday on the Russell the highest level, that was the, the highest level we've closed at since back, I believe, in like the second week of October. So we are starting to see some more strength in small caps, and that would be a really good sign for the market if we could continue to see that. Oh, absolutely. We do need that. Yes, we do. And the other thing we need is to get going because we got a busy lineup. I know you've got your <laughs> workshop today. So what's coming up? Indeed. So tomorrow, because today is the end of the month, Carl, uh, my dad's going to be in tomorrow. We'll, we will be looking at a bunch of the monthly charts. And Bruce Frazier will follow that up on Thursday, Mr. Wyckoff. Friday, Mary Ellen will be back for What's Hot, What's Not. And next week, Brian Livingston will be our guest on Wednesday. Today, busy, busy, I will be going over scanning chart lists and setting alerts. 10 and 10, our first symbol will be Sunrun. Intermarket analysis, uh, Tom will talk about for our last segment. Let's get it started, though, Tom. Alerts, uh, technical news and headlines. I'll talk technical alerts later. Yeah, we got some uh, stuff to report today. First of all, let's get into the economic reports for today. We've got the February Case-Shiller Home Price Index out this morning, rose two-tenths of 1%, which was just a little bit below the three-tenths of 1% expected. Uh, April Chicago PMI, way below expectations. That was a little bit of a surprise, 52.6 
versus 59. But then April consumer confidence came in better than expected. You can see a pretty nice reading there, 129.2 versus the anticipated 127.1. And then the big one, I was really shocked when I saw March pending home sales come in with that huge of an increase, 3.8% versus just seven tenths of 1% expected. And when I take a look at the 10 year treasury yield, I mean, we really didn't get much of a reaction off of uh, all of those economic reports I've mentioned. Uh, you know, over the last five days, we've just been kind of stuck in this 2.50, 2.55% range. And for quite a while, I was really worried about the 10 year treasury yield moving lower, and maybe I still should be. But I think what's going on is the market is anticipating, and maybe we'll hear this from the Fed tomorrow when they announce. Um, but I think the stock market's anticipating maybe that deflation is a bigger concern right now than inflation. Certainly, uh, some of the recent economic reports have shown that inflation is not a problem, and that will help to keep the Fed very dovish. And if you get a dovish Fed with low interest rates and higher growth, as we saw from the GDP report that came out last week, that is really a perfect recipe for higher prices for equity. So I'm still a little nervous about the 10-year Treasury yield moving lower, but maybe the Fed can help calm some of those nerves depending on their statement tomorrow. We'll have to watch and see. Uh, we also had a number of earnings out. And I tell you, earnings season is really kicking into gear. I've uh, been using a couple of slides here so that you can, uh, you know, we can get more of those out there to you. But uh, yesterday after the bell, one of the big ones, Alphabet, came in. And if you just look at the bottom line, you say, hey, what's wrong? Why is the stock down 100 points? Uh, 1190 versus 1057. But they did come up short on their revenues. And when you get these stocks, especially after the big run up in the Internet group, they're priced for perfection. Market is looking for really strong reports. And I think the fact they came up a little bit weak um, is not helping the stock, not helping that group and putting a little bit of pressure on communication services as a whole. Uh, the other stocks on the list, you can see there was a, a mixture of, of beats and misses. MGM talked about earlier, you can see that miss down there, 12 cents versus 16 cents. Western Digital Week report as well. Uh, they had actually already warned and said their, their uh, results were going to come in around 40 cents a share, I believe. And they came in even you know, well below their earlier warning. So West, Western Digital, not, uh, not providing a very good number there. Um, and then uh, this morning, we had another, another slew of reports that came out. And you can take a look at those. MasterCard, which was having a really strong day earlier, has reversed a little. We'll start and take a look at that chart in just a second. Um, but strong report out of MasterCard. And that's what I would have anticipated, given their relative strength and the way this stock has been trading. But it might simply be a buy on rumor, sell on news type event. That's the kind of candle that we're getting. Uh, we'll want to see how we finish on that one today. Um, you can see a list of a uh, number of companies that reported here. One I do want to point out, GE came in better than expected, 14 cents versus 9 cents. And we are getting a nice response in that stock, although we got a lot more work to do on GE. So let's take a look first at um, um, the MasterCard chart. And, um, you know, I, I really like what's going on here. The problem I have is that with this push to the upside, uh, we're kind of failing intraday. Now, maybe we'll strengthen again this afternoon, but you can see the volume already pretty heavy. And so if we continue to weaken this afternoon, we may be putting in a short-term top on MasterCard. Uh, that shouldn't be that worrisome. I and mean, we're talking about a stock that's been going straight up since December. It was 172 back in December. Today, it hits a high of 257. That's almost a 50% move. And we're not talking about a small little technology company. We're talking about a, a giant MasterCard. So for a company like this to move this far, this fast, uh, I think it would be okay if it consolidated for a little bit. So just watch that candle into the close today. I think that will uh, certainly give us some, um, at least a, a little bit of a warning perhaps of maybe some short-term weakness coming up. Google, want to bring this chart up, of course. We got a big move down here on Google, all the way down to the 50-day moving average. And I'll say the last rally began from under 1175. So even though we had the big move down, I believe we still have this uptrend in play. Uh, the fact that we haven't sold off since the open and the fact that everybody is selling at the open. So you got market makers getting in on the other side, providing liquidity. I'm actually expecting Google to bounce from here. I don't own it at this point, but I wouldn't be surprised to see a move higher. Apple, uh, certainly want to pull up Apple. They will be reporting after the bell. We've seen this little bit of a, a selling over the last four or five days. I'm not quite sure what the stock is going to do into its earnings report. 
Uh, we still have some work to do, though, to get back up to the highs in September and October. And that comes with the S&P and NASDAQ breaking out the new all-time highs yesterday. So Apple, if we scroll down here on a relative basis, you can see it's been it's been strengthening versus the S&P 500, but it's nowhere near its relative high that it enjoyed several months ago back at the end of October. Uh, a couple of others. Let's take a look at MGM. This is uh, going to be the last. Actually, I'll take a look at two more that I showed you on the slides. MGM Resorts moved down. Look at the relative strength on MGM relative to the gambling stocks. So while gambling stocks have started to strengthen, they've really been doing it without much help from MGM. So the fact that MGM came up short and uh, moved lower today, this is no surprise at all. This is what the market's been telling me and really what it's been telegraphing. Uh, MRK, this is Merck. This has been one of the best pharmas. The stock getting back up through its 20 day today. I think this is a good sign for the stock. Pharmas overall still well off their earlier high they saw at the end of November. But Merck early in April was trading at a relative high versus its peers. Pulled back with the overall group. I think it was a case of baby being thrown out with the bathwater. But now Merck comes back with a strong report, moves higher. I think stock, if it holds above the 20, start, starting to regain that leadership that we, uh, we uh, became accustomed to. I'm going to go through some other earnings reports that really have caught my eye. Brooks Automation beat top line, beat bottom line. They did guide lower. But look what the market is doing here, what the market is saying. Up 13%, breaking to new highs. I, I really like this breakout above that 34 level. It gapped up above it and continued moving higher. And you can see the relative strength all of a sudden shooting higher. This is one to keep an eye on. WWD, big move, big beat on the bottom line, big beat on the top line. They guided their 19 revenues and earnings per share higher. And look at the stock on a relative basis, just taking off versus its group. It's a... Uh, uh, industrial machinery peers. A really nice chart there. Zebra. This is one that I picked back in uh, February, one of my top picks. Stock was doing really well, came out with earnings. They did beat top and bottom line, but I think very similar to like um, maybe Chipotle. It had run so far that the stock just saw some selling coming in. I think this is an opportunity actually on the stock. CNX. This is one that uh, missed by a mile on the top line and on the bottom line. Look at the relative strength on this stock versus its peers and look at the stock the its peers versus the S&P 500 you've got a horrible group a horrible stock within that group and they came out and they missed by a mile on their report look at this heavy volume selling we shouldn't be surprised by this this is why i would not touch these stocks that are underperforming usually there's a reason for it we found out that reason this morning um Shopify I've talked about the strength in this stock. They came out beat on the top line, beat on the bottom line, guided higher for quarter two. They raised their fiscal year 19 outlook, stock up 7.8%, and it's in that strong software space. This is one to keep an eye on in quarter two. All right, we know that uh, spring showers or April showers bring May flowers. Well, we got uh, April earnings going to bring some 800 flowers to the, to the uh, uh, forefront here. Big move up in 800 flowers. Like Zebra, ZBRA, this was also one of the stocks I liked back on February 19th. It has continued moving higher, and it actually got a lift with earnings today. It beat top line, beat bottom line, guided its uh, fiscal year 19 earnings per share higher. And the last one I have, another solid report here, MCOR Group, EME. One of the best stocks in its group. You can see this triple top relative breakout versus its peers. Solid volume has been coming into the stock, into its earnings report. They beat by a mile on their top line. Bottom line, a buck twenty-eight versus a buck seven. An easy beat there. And they also guided fiscal year nineteen revenue uh, and earnings per share higher. So I think this is a really nice move. Look at the breakout on an absolute basis to go along with a breakout on an a uh, relative basis. EME certainly looking very strong. All right, Aaron, upgrades, downgrades, what you got for today? All right, let's do this. I've got three upgrades and three downgrades to talk to you all about. Let's go ahead and we're going to start with Alaska Air Group, ALK. JP Morgan upgraded Alaska Airlines today from neutral to overweight. They moved their price target from $71 to $72. So they did move it up a little bit here. I'm looking at overhead resistance at that $70 level, of course, where you're, you're seeing that top back from September. 
I thought this was a pretty interesting looking chart chart in that at first I was looking, there was a little bit of a flag formation here, got the breakout, didn't quite hit the target uh, and started consolidating sideways. But what's happened since then? We got a 20, 50 day EMA positive crossover. So that is an intermediate term trend model buy signal as far as decision point is concerned. You can see that declining tops trend line and the breakout today on this upgrade. And then notice, you know, the PMO had started to turn over a little bit, but even before we got the announcement of this upgrade, notice that we were already seeing the PMO had started to turn back up and it does look like it's ready to continue higher. The only issue I'd have right now is this 200 day EMA could pose strong resistance, might take a little while for it to get above that, but that might be a good signal that we will see a move to challenge that $67 level from the February top and possibly back here at that September top for $70. All right, next one up is JD.com. It was upgraded also by J Mor P Morgan today from a neutral to an overweight. There was no target set there. And as you can see, another declining tops trend line in the short term and a breakout today. Uh, this comes off of a nice bounce off the 50 and 200 day EMAs. The 50 is just now, or I'm sorry, the five day EMA is just now crossing above the 20. So that's a short term trend model buy. And look at the very nice PMO. It decelerated. It had already started to decelerate yesterday with uh, the rally. Today it's uh, turned up. So you already had a strong scooter going on here and volume you know, it's been rather flat. Of course, we got the, the break on it, uh, the OBV to the downside on that big volume uh, down day, but we're starting to come back out. Uh, you know, I like this, uh, JD.com. It's, you know, it's, it's made a nice uh, steady move. You haven't had to really, um, you know, put up with any terrible declines, especially since the 50 had been below that 200 for so long. Uh, there's that 20, 50 day EMA positive crossover. That's when we got the buy signal was at the end of January for JDCom. It's been a slow mover, but it, it's been moving in the right direction. Northrop Grumman was upgraded today uh, from a neutral to an overweight. Uh, you can see we have the PMO, PMO buy signal come in uh, earlier in April, and we've continued on a, a fairly nice uh, rising trend here. Uh, when you look at this, I haven't, I'm going to actually annotate it just a little bit here. There's your rising bottoms trend line in the short term. I think that's a pretty obvious look. Um, what I usually like to do is try and drag it up and see if I can find the corresponding uh, rising trend channel. You could make a case for one, but we got that big break out there. I actually see this as a broadening formation. And you can take it here, you could take it there, but in any case, it's a broadening. So the, that means that the volatility is getting, um, uh, you're getting a rise in the volatility, obviously, because your your uh, channel or the, the uh, yeah, the channel that you're traveling in is getting bigger and bigger with a broadening pattern. So typically they're, they're bearish patterns. I don't like to get involved in them. Uh, but right now we're, we're flirting with this $290 level. We tried to have, we had a failed breakout. Now we're going to go for it again. I think the PMO is set up a lot, uh, set up more positively. We got rid of some of that volume, uh, that negative volume, and now it's time to make that move to the upside. We'll have to see if this volume bar today cooperates. All righty, let's move on to some downgrades. All right, Bank of America was downgraded today from an overweight weight to a neutral. I like the look of this chart. Uh, on a downgrade, I, I have to say, I mean, the chart still looks pretty, pretty good. We got the breakout and now we're getting the pullback and we haven't pulled back yet below that area of uh, what was overhead resistance. Uh, it's still sitting there. There is the issue, of course, that when we did hit at that interday high, when we hit at that uh, high back from August, price turned right back down. So that was a bit of a failure there. And you can see $31 is gonna be a little bit more difficult, but I like the, the initial breakout here. And notice the PMO still looks very positive. Uh, so on a downgrade, um, I, I have to say, if, if I were sitting there at the table, I would say, you know what? I don't think this one should be downgraded. Uh, so let's move on. Cognex. 
I had owned this stock and I woke up this morning and I was at first uh, a little bit, ah, because I saw this, but then I had remembered that um, I had sold it. Basically, the PMO had turned over uh, for a second time. And so right about up here is when I, I sold my um, shares. And thank the Lord I did, because obviously a really bad day today on the downgrade. I expect more going on there. Uh, it, Cognex was downgraded by Bernstein and Needham. Uh, both of them moved them into the, the hold or market perform category. But boy, you see a drop like this and trading below the 200-day EMA. Uh, obviously, pretty ugly looking chart. Uh, I wouldn't be holding it. I, I already told you I'm not holding it. I fortunately got out and uh, before this. All right, next one, Paychex was also downgraded today from a market perform to an underperform. You know, I liked the look of this chart when it first came up, but then I looked at the PMO in the thumbnail, and despite price moving mostly sideways, it actually looks like it's in a little bit of a rising trend, the PMO turned down below the signal line. So to me, that was uh, that was already telling me there were some problems. And again, it had already decelerated below that signal line even before today's downgrade. That's all I have for upgrades and downgrades. Here is the list of what I just talked about. And the ones that I did not talk about are also on that list. It'll be up in the Market Watchers Live Recap after the program later today, if you wanted to go look at those charts in particular. Um, Facebook, I did see, got an upgrade uh, today as well. That came in late. I saw that later. Uh, that was the other big one I thought you might want to know about. Hey, Aaron. All right. Mm -hmm. Um, also, Cognex, I just want to let you know, they did report earnings yesterday after the bell. Mm -hmm. and So they, they beat their revenues. They matched uh, earnings estimates, but they lowered their guidance going forward. So that was the reason for the gap down and probably also the reason for the downgrade. Yeah. And see, I wasn't even playing the earnings are coming up card. I was just looking at what the chart was telling me. So that's kind of an interesting thing how that will work out. But yes, I was pretty happy about that one. Um, there's another one I'm not particularly happy about right now, but we're going to be talking about that one later. So, all right, let's go ahead and move on into uh, my workshop today. And uh, what I was planning on doing today for my workshop, let me get everything all ready here for us. I am going to talk to you about scanning chart lists and setting alerts. And, you know, I talk scanning all the time. And honestly, scanning a chart list is just one little tiny piece of the whole scanning uh, picture puzzle. Uh, so if you've watched any of my other scanning workshops, this is just going to give you a little bit of the, the next level up uh, as far as just moving it a little bit more to the advanced side, uh, but not that much, you'll see. So I'm going to show you how to scan chart lists. And then I thought uh, the last time I did scanning, I was going to talk to you about alerts but I never quite got to it. Uh, so I'm gonna spend some time on how to set alerts and how I use them and how you might wanna use them. So let's go ahead and get started here. So before I really get into it, um, I do need to preface by saying what is available to each uh, membership level. And I'm not being salesy. I just want you to understand <laughs> what you can and can't do. Uh, so with the basic membership, you only have the one chart list uh, and you don't get to have custom scans so that today's uh, information on scanning a chart list really doesn't uh, pertain to you today, but I'm certain that when you watch it, uh, maybe you want to move to the next level where you can start getting some technical alerts. And of course, your scanning ability uh, increases as well as your chart list uh, uh, creation and, and the amount you can have increases by quite a bit just by moving up to that one level. Uh, highly recommend if you want to do some of the stuff I'm showing you today, I think you might uh, want to. And then, of course, if you get to the, the pro level, then, you know, you have even more. Um, but I think even with the extra membership, you can still do, uh, there's a lot that you can do with this. And so that's what I'm going to show you today. All right. So um, the predefined scans come with your basic membership and you can get to them from the member homepage. And we're going to run a predefined scan. Um, I'll show you how I save my 
results like I always do with that scan dump. And then we're going to look at creating our own scan. And again, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this part today because I have done that in the past. Uh, if you go to YouTube, I suspect you can look it up. Um, you probably can find it on the Stock Charts YouTube channel if you go uh, and look in there. So I recommend you go check that out if you want a little bit more detailed information on how to create a scan. And then I'm going to show you how to create what I call a hybrid scan which takes a predefined scan and you just sort of add your own stuff to it. And that really uh, plays well into what we're going to do today as far as scanning a chart list. Because uh, you can take that predefined scan and then uh, set it up to scan on your chart list. And that's a hybrid scan. And I'll show you that as well. <clears throat> and then we're going to show you how to scan that chart list um, using the current scans that you have, uh, the ones we just created, uh, and then how you can scan that chart list with the predefined scan. Like I said, that's going to be more of uh, in that hybrid section. And then we're going to go into the alerts, like I said, uh, price alerts, advanced alerts, etc. So now I've just like thrown it all at you and you remembered everything, right, that I'm going to go over. Let's go hit it. So I'm going to go ahead and start us on. Let's get in here. There it is. Okay. All right. So we will start from the handy dandy uh, member homepage. Okay, so uh, let's move on down here. Here are your chart lists if you have it set up like this on your homepage like I do. And here are where you, you have your scans and here are the alerts that you may or may not have running. And as you can see, I have six of them right now. We'll talk about those in just a moment. So we're going to start off, like I said, let's start off with those predefined scans because they're out there, they're ready to go. And then I will show you how you can move one of those uh, to scan just a chart list of yours. So I'm actually, I want to make sure that first of all, I have some good chart lists right now. I will probably create some as we go along here. But I want to see how many I have that we can really get some good scans on. Let's see here. Alrighty, my scan dump only has 24 stocks in it. So I'm going to actually run a scan right now that I already have set up. And I'm going to dump it in here so that I have our sample uh, chart list that we're going to scan against. So let's go ahead and do that first. So we will go to one of those predefined scans. I keep moving this all over the place. All right, so which one do we want to pick? I want to pick something with a, a lot of uh, results. Uh, so here's one that has 321 for those uh, highs. Here's uh, some of our bearish ones, 360. I'm going to go right up here just with the, the new 52-week highs and click on that. And as you can see, there's a lot of stuff in here <clears throat> that you may or may not want uh, that I know I may or may not want. So while I love this scan and it has all those results, uh, I'm going to want to uh, edit it. I'm going to want to change it. But right now, I'm just going to save it with all of these results in it just so we have a chart list that's good to scan against. And I'm going to save it in ScanDum. And as I've talked about in previous scanning workshops, I highly recommend that you set up uh, what I call sort of a transient uh, chart list, one that you dump all your scans in, and then you sort of muddle through that and move the important charts from that scan dump into a chart list that is going to be, uh, that will stay there for you, uh, a permanent chart list. This makes it easy to immediately just throw everything in there and you don't have to worry because I'm not, I know I'm not writing over anything that I want because I, I know that this list is set up that way, that it, there isn't anything that I want in it because I've already taken it out. All right, so we are replacing that. Let's get that moving. There we go. Yes, so now we have how many? 322. Okay, so that's going to be too many that we're not, and we don't want all of them. We already determined that. All right, so we used a predefined scan. 
and we got this chart list, right? So it has uh, all of the stocks right now that are hitting new 52 week highs. So this should have a good amount of uh, stocks that we might wanna be interested in. So let's go ahead and I have my list now, my chart list, and now I wanna scan against just that chart list. I don't wanna do a scan that's gonna take, uh, you know, give me everything uh, from everywhere. I, I just want to look at what's in that chart list. And as an example, the ones that I have, uh, the, the alerts that I have are all set up on one particular chart list. And it's my DP market sector summary chart list. So all of my alerts go up against this particular chart list. So this is how I find out whether I have a short-term trend model, intermediate-term trend model, a long-term trend model, buy signal, sell signal, neutral. If any of those come through on any of the sector spiders or their equal weight partners, I get an alert in my email. So I don't wanna scan against everything for those, uh, those trend model signals. I just wanna go against the stuff that I need to know uh, I'm getting a change on. So that's one of the reasons I really like uh, the opportunity and the ability to, to do my scans and my alerts off of one chart list. All right, so let's go ahead and start looking at how to scan against some of these chart lists. So I'm gonna just take us to the scanning, the advanced scan workbench. Okay, so it's already setting it up for me to, to do whatever scan it is that I want. Well, I'm gonna take one of my favorites right now, which is the bullish EMAs and a mid-range scooter. Uh, it also has a PMO rising. Uh, and as you can see, for me, the way to screen out a lot of the information that I want is I put, I usually put this at the top of all of my scans, uh, just so that I get, you know, only the US stocks with a somewhat decent amount of um, average daily volume. Uh, I do adjust this one a lot. I'll make it a little higher, uh, usually not lower, usually higher if the results I'm getting, I'm not seeing what I want. Uh, and then I like to get those that close uh, higher than $10 just to, to um, avoid too much volatility. So I have this scan and let's say I wanna run it just against that scan dump, that chart list that I have. I wanna know of all of those that are making new 52 week highs, how many of them fit within my scan criteria that I like to look at every day? So how are we gonna do that? Well, first of all, I'm gonna um, save this as something different because I don't wanna write over it. And so I'm gonna just add, let's put example at the beginning of this. There we are. Okay, so now we have a different one. So I just wanna scan against my scan dump chart list. So I, I don't need any of this anymore because I know what's in that chart list already fits, um, well, actually it doesn't in this case, but generally will fit this criteria. So I could actually just write over this criteria. Today I'm not gonna just because I did use that scan dump and that will pull out uh, those US uh, stocks from that chart list, but we need to first tell it to go to that, that uh, chart list. So if you come down here and you have all of these opportunities to add to your scan, one is called chart lists. And so I get to go in here and I can pick whichever one it is I want. I'm gonna pick that one that, like I said, we just did. And I'm gonna add it here. Well, it always adds everything to the bottom of your scan, but I wanna see it at the top. And there's one other thing we're gonna have to do here. All right, so there's, I want to scan on this chart list. There's a little X here because you can't have an and starting everything. So that's one problem. And then the other is that I don't have an and here. Well, I know that it's a stock already because it came from that particular chart list. I'm going to leave in the daily volume and country US in there because I happen to know that in that chart list, there are some of these that I don't want. 
but I'm starting off with that chart list. All righty. So let us, since this is an example anyway, I'm going to save this. And let's run it and see what we get. So we had 322 in the scan dump chart list, and I've now made it down to 15 by just putting in the scan on my chart list. And I know Tom probably uses this a lot because of he, his um, strong earnings, and I think you even have a weak earnings chart list. Uh, I know you would scan against these chart lists so that it pretty much takes you to the stuff you're only interested in. I only want to look at the strong earnings, or I only want to look at those that are, you know, with a PMO rising or a 50-day EMA that's above the 200-day EMA, that sort of thing. You are correct. I do use both of them. Well, recently I've kind of flushed the weak earnings because that was used more for shorting. And right. I I don't think we're in a market to short at this point. So that I don't use anymore. But yes, I do routinely, especially if the market starts to roll over, I do routinely keep two lists and I do scan against those two lists quite often. Right. And I, like I said, I'm going to show you the alerts when I get there, but I do this every day um, in the background. So now I found those 15 out of the scan dump that I wanted. I can now, if I wish, save them to another list, which I might want to do because remember, these are in my scan dump. These are these stocks are going away the next time I run a scan. So if I wanted to keep these, uh, then I probably would want to store them in a new chart list or a different chart list. I'm just going to do this one right here, but I'm going to move this to the front. I think that it's easier to, to go through when I have the date first on them. So there you are. There's those, there are the 15 that fit those criteria that I liked. So that's really all that is required to scan against a chart list is to add it into your scan. And all it is is right there. So you would just add that at the top of your list. So uh, let's let's see. Now that I have this and I run it against the list I want, Let's say at this point, now I want to set an alert because I want to know any time when, when I get results from this scan on that chart list, I want to be notified. That's what your alert will do for you. And we have simple price alerts, which I'll show you. And then we have the little bit more complicated alerts. And those are the ones that work off of your scans, just like we're showing right now. Okay. So I'm going to move us over right now to the alert section. And you can get to it various ways. I'm going to show you from the home page, the technical alert workbench. All right. So the first one are price alerts. Um, I actually don't have any set right now, but typically uh, I have them set for what's in my portfolio. Um, I erased it because I just for privacy, I didn't want you to have everything that I have in my, my accounts, but uh, you can throw these in here at any one you want. So let's see. So for example, maybe I want to look at, uh, well, let me take a peek here on my other computer, what looks interesting. All right, well, let's pick a favorite. How about GE? And I'm gonna have it alert me via the website whenever my alert comes true. So here's your current chart and what's going on with it. Uh, and it's at $10.09. So let's say that if it crosses below uh, $10.09, I want to get alerted. All right. So there it is. And I'll save it. There we go. And now I should get alerted when it crosses below $10.09. I'm going to actually add an alert also for it crossing above, just so that we'll see the alert come in while we're doing this. So an alert if it goes above uh, $10.09. I'm going to save that too. There we go. And that'll come in on the website. And here you go. There are price alerts right there. There's the one crosses above. I guess I need to do the below now. 
might not let you do both because, yeah, <laughs> it knows what I'm trying to do. And it's saying, no, you're going to bog down my system. Okay. Well, we, if it goes below $10.09, we'll be notified. Let's see. We can add another one in here. Let's try adding. Uh, let's see. We can add um, Pinterest is kind of an, an, a new one. So let's look at pins. See, it's a it's a new one that's come out. So I'm going to ask, and now it's uh, it's down almost seven percent. So I would would like to know when it gets above. Well, there's thirty two fifty. It's at thirty one. Let's say we want to see. Well, since the day is going the wrong direction for it, let's go down. We're going to look at not a percentage, are we? Yeah, two percent down. What would that be? Thirty one twenty four would be two percent down. I'm going to go ahead and. Uh, make it even less than that because, again, I'd like the alert to happen hopefully while we're here. So $30, let's say $0.85. Cents. And there we go. Okay. So that's running in the background. The, the one that I want to talk to you about next, we're going to look at the advanced alerts. So we just set a simple price alert, a couple of them. And we'll wait and see if those uh, go through. Now, the email, the other one was an email, and I didn't want that. I want that to be on the website, too. We'll just save that. There we go. Okay. So that's going on. Um, advanced alerts. Now, advanced alerts are sort of the same idea, only what we're doing is we're taking a scan and uh, making it become an alert. For example, uh, here are the ones that I run every day. So let's look at a simple one, long-term PMO crossovers. Uh, oh, that's on that other one, that's fine. Okay, notice the first line. It's scanning off of my favorites list. And the other is all I want is to see if the PMO, the monthly PMO crosses above its um, signal line, or I want it to be the exact opposite if it crosses uh, basically a crossover. That's what I'm looking for, positive or negative. Uh, so that is what that alert does. And when it comes in, I have it run only at market close, and I only need them to tell me if I have something more than zero, and I do want it to be on email, and I want it to always run. So what you can do is once it's uh, run, it'll pause it, or you can have it delete, however you want to work that. But I keep mine on a continuation. So there is an easy way to do this because it's obviously these are all the same. It's just like the scanning workbench. So if you have a scan you like and you want it to run as an alert, the easiest way to do this, and honestly, you, the idea really uh, can come from what I've seen Julius do, is you make a second browser window. Let's see if I can make it get smaller. And we're just going to shrink it. Come on now. All right, I think we're getting it smaller here, right? My screen is at a different setting. I'm going to actually, if I get rid of that, I think we'll be OK. Or not. Forgive me. I'm trying to get this set up so that they're uh, next to each other and my screen doesn't want to cooperate here. All right, here we go, right? Well, this is pretty annoying. Let's see if I can do it over here. Here we go. I can do it off screen. Here we are. All right, so there's that one. And we're going to go to the advanced scan workbench that we were on. So this is the scanning one. Let me go and shrink this one for us. So basically, you're just taking two browser windows and sitting them up next to each other. This, And again, this is exactly what Julius does when he does his RRG. He likes to be able to look at um, 
the chart and then the RRG on the other side. So here's my scanning workbench. And here's my alert workbench. And all you have to do is pick that scan that you want. So let's go my favorite scans. Well, where are my scans? Oh, I think I'm in the wrong. Oh, that's because I'm in Market Watchers. I don't have any on that one. Okay. Well, let's come back over here. There we go. And we will do here. And now I will have what I need. There we go. Okay. So here are all my scans. Over here are my alerts. All right, so we're gonna create an alert off of uh, the scan that I like right now, this bullish uh, scan. I I did post this in a Market Watchers live recap somewhere. I can't tell you which date, I just don't remember, but if you want the actual scan, that's where you get it. So here I have that scan and now I wanna create an alert. So I'm gonna say, okay, I want a new alert. I'm gonna have it run all day long. No, I'm gonna have it just run at the market close. And if I get a results greater than zero, go ahead and tell me via email and automatically pause it after it's run. So I don't want this to run continuously. I just want it to tell me at the end of the day via email if any of my results come through on this particular scan. Okay, so actually I'm gonna go ahead, we'll take this, so I'm copying it all and I'm just taking it over to the alert workbench and, and putting it in here. So now the alert is gonna run using that scan that I had. Now, if I wanted to do it on a particular chart list, I can come down here, chart list. Let's run that scan on scan dump. And where it is right there, but I'll have to bring it to the front so I know what it's doing. Just gonna cut that. And then we'll move. I don't need any of this information because I'm just going off of this particular list. Gotta get that and out of the front though. Save. And we'll just call this, um, well, example. And there we go. And now I have that as an alert. So the trick is, is if you take the scan that you want to be an alert, I would set up the two windows and that way you can just copy and paste and then you're able to compare it. It makes it a lot easier. All right. So that pretty much covers the scanning and um, the how to do alerts. Let me go ahead and I'm gonna get you a a summary slide here. But I hope this helped uh, everybody understand them a little bit. The scans and the technical alerts are really the same, believe it or not, except one is a notification. So I, I think that it, it, it's a pretty good setup to do uh, the two next to each other. And I really, I came up with the idea um, on my own. Before I saw Julius do what he, he did, mainly because I knew, I realized, all I need is to copy and paste, but I don't want to have to keep going back and forth and not understand what I'm actually doing in the middle because I don't know about you, but many times I, get, I lose uh, what's going on uh, from the point of one screen to going to the next. I actually can, I actually will forget sometimes what I'm doing. So um, it's helpful to have the two side by side. All right, so what did we do today? I showed you how to set up scans. Uh, we scanned according to a chart list. Uh, really all that is scanning on a chart list is adding that piece of code to the top of your scan. That is all that you really need to do. Price alerts, I showed you how to set those very quickly. The scan alerts, again, same thing. It's just you, you move your scan as an, a technical alert and now you can get that in email every day. Uh, and, and use those no notifications for those alerts. So that's all I had as far as our presentation today as the workshop uh, concludes. 
But now I think it would be interesting to look at that poll that we have been running to see how many of you actually use alerts or even know that we have uh, technical alerts out there. So here we go. Yes, I had a feeling that we would get, uh, that that would be the winner. What is an alert? Because we don't really talk about alerts. We talk more about uh, scanning. And so it, it's not a surprise to see that happen, at least in, in my opinion. I don't know. What do you think, Tom? Well, I couldn't answer the question. Oh, was I too confusing? Well, no. Um, I know what a technical alert is, but I don't have any. <laughs> so um, I couldn't fill it out. I, uh -huh. I just don't, didn't have any. And, you know, for me, the reason I'm, I'm very active in the market and I'm always watching the market. I'm looking at my stocks periodically throughout the day. Um, but, pr but it would still help me to use the technical alert. There's no doubt about it because there have been uh, times when I should have either been out of a stock or maybe into a stock and I just didn't catch it. Especially if you use a chart list like I do that has 200, 300 stocks on it. Um, you can think you're watching them pretty closely, but when you get into intraday action and you think you're, you know, you're looking at a stock, you say, well, it's still got 3% to go before it hits support. So I'll just make a note of it. Well, sometimes in the morning when you get the big moves down, you can get that trigger of, you know, hitting a key support level um, and not really realize it because you might look at the market and say, well, it's flat. You know, probably I haven't lost 3% on that stock when in fact, sometimes these individual stocks are pretty volatile. So if you haven't used technical alerts, I would certainly recommend that you do use them. I think it would help. And if I wasn't looking at the market all day, if I was working, you know, regularly, you know, during the day, another job and didn't have time to follow my stocks, I would absolutely set technical alerts up so I could at least have stock charts looking at it for me while I was working. Yes, exactly. And like for me, having those uh, alerts at the end of the day to tell me if any of the sector spiders or those equal weight, um, you know, ETFs or just uh, the major markets, you know, the NASDAQ and NASDAQ 100, I get that immediate alert at the end of the day. If any of them have had crossovers of a PMO, a 5, 20, 50 or 200 day EMA crossovers, I just get that in my email at the end of the day. And I know everything I need to know <laughs> as far as getting ready to do my analysis or my blogs. And it also initiates blog articles at times for me because I'll find that an alert comes through. And even though maybe I didn't see anything in particular I wanted to write about in the market, I have signals that have arrived in my email box at the end of the market day. Yep. Agreed. All right. Andy, Ready to go on? <clears throat> let us move on to the 10 and 10. And of course, I have just been talking away, so I haven't in, been in the chat room yet, guys. So we're gonna start with Sunrun, which we already picked out. And then those uh, likes, put those in there, and the second uh, will be the most popular from the chat room. All right, uh, Sunrun, um, well, I looked to see if there was a story. I didn't see a story. I expected that earnings were out or something, but I didn't see anything. Stock's down 10% today. Um, uh, you know, looking at the chart, it was breaking out. So that was a good thing. Uh, it did clear a key level at around 1640 or so. Um, if there was one warning sign on the chart, it was that as the renewable energy group as a whole was moving higher since the beginning of March, we've actually seen a little bit of deterioration in the relative strength of uh, run relative to its peers. So that would be the only negative that I, that I really see. And when we did make this breakout, when I look down here, I don't see a lot of volume to support it. So maybe there were a couple of warning signs here, but the stock down a lot, I think gapping back down below the 1640 area is not a good short-term sign. And the fact that we've sold off on heavier volume, obviously not a good sign. But I, I think that currently uh, run is probably between 14, let's just call it 16 and a half. I think that's the range for now. We'll see which way it hold, you know, which, which level actually breaks out or whether or not these levels hold for a period of time. But that's the range that I would use. Not, uh, I really wasn't uh, thinking negatively about the stock, but after, you know, pulling it up and, and taking a look, you can see that we actually topped out on a relative basis several months ago versus the group. So as we were moving higher with the stock, the group was actually moving up faster telling us that, you know, maybe it's just a case of a rising tide lifts all boats within this space. Um, but yeah, this, and I don't know if you know what happened there, and I don't know if this was one of the downgrades or what was going no. on. 
I have no idea. And I have to admit, this was this one I didn't sell. <laughs> so I had such a great, I, this morning woke up and like all of my gains, almost all of them gone. And I have no idea. I didn't have time to really look it up, but um, someone in the chat room will probably let us know. But that was, boy, there was no reason that I was really happy with that stock. Everything looked strong. I didn't have any of those. Like with CG and X, I sort of had a little bit of warning with the PMO. I didn't really see anything here to tell me. Yeah, and I'm not sure. Maybe this is in sympathy with another stock in the group. Um, that I don't know. I didn't. I looked individually at this stock. I didn't see anything on Sunrun. But um, yeah, technically, I don't like the gap down. Obviously, the volume picking up and the big red candle selling. I mean, you can see. And this stock isn't for everyone. I mean, you know, when you look back, you can see some of these huge moves. I mean, this stock ran from nine up to 16 and a half. With, that's probably like a 70% move in two months. And then you can see here from 15 down to nine, maybe in three weeks, it lost 40% of its value. And then the uh, first two months of this year, the stock's up probably 80%. Um, this is clearly a, a stock that's got a lot of volatility. So, you know, if you're uh, if if you try to stay away from some of the inherent risk in the market, this is a stock you really want to try to stay away from, in my opinion. But, you know, if you like the 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 excitement and the big returns that you can get, you just have to live with the kind of downside that you get from time to time here as well. But uh, not looking good, obviously down 10% today. We'll see whether or not this uh, trading range holds. Yeah, exactly. There's that and the rising bottoms I'm really looking at right now because I know everybody's saying, well, when are you going to sell it then? <laughs> right now, I mean, I'm still at a profit. I still think that there's still some upside potential. So I'm not quite ready yet. All right. What up? What's up? Next one, uh, most popular in the chat room is QCOM, Qualcomm. Yeah, hard not to like this stock. I mean, and really a couple clouds lifted. We talked about that earlier. But, you know, when you get a stock that's been, un, you know, with that huge cloud hanging over it with the litigation with Apple, uh, this was a stock that you just had to be careful because you just never know what could have come out of that litigation. But they literally settled right here on, it was like three o'clock in the afternoon on April 16th. And that, this move right here was in the last hour. That's how big this news was getting that that uh, case settled with Apple and then they there was also an announcement I think it may have been after hours Intel said they were getting out of the 5G market so all of a sudden now you've got Qualcomm getting a win in two different areas against two major competitors or, or foes however you want to look at it but yeah I mean this has been a big breakout I think now looking at the chart I think you've got great support down at that level now you might say well we're not going to go all the way we're not going to lose ten dollars well, I've seen crazier things. Uh, this has been a huge move to the upside. You get a little profit taken, kick in, kicked in. Maybe one valuation downgrade or something. You never know. And you could be back down in the upper 70s. I actually like it there. I think if you get a pullback, uh, I would be a fan of Qualcomm at that level. Huge volume came in to support this move to the upside. So I think this is a real move for Qualcomm with a lot of clouds lifted. All right. Excellent. How about uh, GLW? Corning. Yeah, I, I think find that interesting. It's Corning, but it's GLW. I know there's something in there. I can't remember why, but yeah, probably something to do with the glass. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, they're uh, they did report. I think uh, it was either this morning or last night, and that's the reason for the big gap down on heavy volume. Um, this is another one, though. I think the the warning was out there. If you paid attention, looked at these relative charts. Um, and they're not going to work every time. I'm just saying that these can provide you some warnings when not to take a risk. This is a stock that folks were getting out of within the telecom equipment space. It has not been a favorite for the last three months. So to get this kind of negative reaction should not have been a huge surprise based on what was going on. The group has been flying, continuing to put in new highs. And if you look over the last couple of months, Corning couldn't break out in that environment. So I think now you're looking at a couple of uh, support levels, one being the bottom of gap support. We almost got there. And I'm talking about this gap over here. And then you got the top of gap uh, of this gap. So I think you're in this range now in the short term between 30 and, you know, 30 and a quarter and $32. Uh, let's see what which way it breaks out of it. Overall, because I'm bullish the market, you've got higher lows coming in intermediate term. I suspect we'll begin to move back to the upside. 
but I'm going to like a lot of other stocks in telecom equipment before I like this one. All righty. Next one up, I know a favorite symbol of yours, Momo. Yeah, another one I saw in the news, and I think they may also have reported, or maybe it was yesterday because there's the big volume. It may have been yesterday I saw they reported. Um, I don't like the change in character here. Uptrend, first of all, it's in the software space, breaking out. That's awesome. The problem is, look at the relative strength. I mean, if I'm going to get a software stock, I want something other than Momo just because uh, you know, we're not far from a 52-week relative low. We had a big gap up. If there's a, a positive here is we haven't lost that gap support. So let me just draw that line in here. So you want to kind of keep an eye on that. But this is where we gapped up back in March on the heavy volume. But I just see, a, you know, move down, volume trends starting to turn negative, and failures where you don't want to see failures, the declining 20-day moving average. So I think as we move forward, we have to respect the moving average to the upside and get back up through that before I would even consider the stock. I think there are a lot of other software stocks look better. I'm going to pass on Momo. All righty. Next one up, Square. So I guess that would be Momo no Mo. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All right. Uh, really uh, got to have it. <laughs> <laughs> Square, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that they're going, I think they report uh, coming up here in the next couple of days. I talked about this one last week. I think it was a segment I was doing with Mary Ellen. And I actually went out on a limb and said, I think Square could come through with a nice report. We just saw PayPal report. Now, this one, you know, has been downtrending. So this is not for, you know, this isn't something where I'm, I'm saying, okay, there's no doubt that we are going to go higher here. I think that the market is telling us to be cautious. That's what this tells me right here. And we've already talked about this on a couple of stocks. Square is underperforming. A strong group, I mean, when we look at the financial administration group, here it is breaking out versus the S&P 500. But, in a, and if you go back further, you'll see that Square came up such a huge amount. It went from like 10 to 100, from what I recall, in, in a year. And so I think this consolidation is necessary. And I'm not sure they don't come out with a blowout report. Just a gut feeling. Um, I, I don't try to invest off my gut feeling. But a gap up and a move back through 83 or 84, I think would be extremely bullish for Square. So, and I know we're at 73, but we've seen these big gap ups and gap downs. If they come through with some solid earnings being in this strong group, we could see a huge gap up. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say we get one. All right. This one reminded me of Easter just from the uh, symbol. I don't know if everybody will understand why, but P A A S. Pan American Silver, the Paws brand. I <laughs> yeah, I can't. With that. What's that? I grew up with that brand, the oh. Paws brand of uh, egg coloring. I don't know if you're familiar. I am not. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this one has just been a long term. You know, it's in a long term downtrend. I'm a momentum investor or trader, so when I see a, a stock moving like this on an absolute basis. And it's one of the worst uh, stocks within this particular uh, industry group within materials. I just don't see anything. I mean, here, this is the stock's performance relative to the S&P 500. I, outside of just saying, hey, we're nearing a price support level, which we are. We actually just bounced off of it. I don't, there's nothing else on this chart that interests me. And I'm not going to buy it based on just a support level. I want to see a stock uptrending. Uh, in a strong group, and then pulling back to a support level, then I'm interested. This kind of support, I mean, how many support levels have we failed to hold on the way down? I I would pass. I'm not interested. Oh, yeah. That looks pass. like a descending pass. triangle. It it tells me that we should expect that breakdown, even though it's already been going that far down. Yeah. All right. How about, let's see, 5.9? I happen to be 5.9, actually. F-I-V-N. Oh, that's right. This was five below. Um, five, nine. Well, I like five below better. Uh, <laughs> um, I think five, nine is just consolidating and it's in a, it's in the software space. I would not be surprised to see a breakout from this consolidation. Now this one's downtrending, but it hasn't broken down. I don't think on a uh, more, you know, longer term basis. Let me annotate a couple of things here. First, we had the breakout right there at about the 48 level. See the top, see all these tops over here, breakout, heavy volume. When we broke back to the downside, look at the double bottom right at price support. 
I think we are just simply consolidating off of an uptrend. And when you consolidate and the group keeps going higher, you're going to get that negative, um, you know, that, that uh, um, negative kind of connotation from from underperforming your peers for a while. But I think off of a move from 35 to 57 in two or three months, I think the stock's entitled to a little bit of underperformance. So in the strong group, I suspect we're going to get a breakout, but we've got to work our way through this consolidation first. All right. How about iRobot, IRBT? Oh, yeah, bad report last week. Um, I don't I don't really care for this one much. I think that the 95 level is going to have to hold here. And it did run up a lot. I mean, again, talking about a stock that ran from $73 over 130 in two and a half months. So, you know, it's price for perfection. Comes out with, with a not so great report. I think what I would be looking at, number one, I would mark that as my key resistance. That's where we gap down and the selling kicked in on massive volume at 110. So to get back through 110, that would be a bullish signal, especially if volume would, you know, returns. Um, but off of the big volume gap up in February and the pullback, buyers kicked in at 95. So I would look at this as a trading range right now in Ivory about 95 to 110. We'll see which way it breaks first. You know, you do still have the higher highs and so far the higher lows. So you, I could make an argument, but that kind of selling with big volume, it, mm, I'm going to watch for a little while here. All right. Sounds like a plan. Our only healthcare sector request, e Eli Lilly, LLY. Yeah, Merck reported, Pfizer reported, and Lilly reported. We got positive reactions to both Pfizer and Merck, but not on Lilly, although we are off the earlier low. Still down a couple percent. Uh, volume not great on this uh, earnings-related news today. I would have to see a move back through the 20-day moving average. So on this case, you know, when I, I don't see sideways consolidation, I see right now a trend below the 20-day moving average. So I think on this one, I would just be pointing out, you know, this kind of uh, bearish behavior so far until we get back through that 20-day. I'm going to pay attention to the fact that we are trending lower. The other thing I think that's important too is the fact that we are deteriorating and we are below our 20-day moving average and we're, we're starting to trade in a more bearish fashion. Failures at that 20-day moving average. Moves to the downside on increasing volume. Rallies on lesser volume. All these things bother me a little bit. I prefer Merck. All righty. Let's see the last one we have, DR Horton or DH Horton, DHI. All right. Uh, well, good news is we're in the home building space. Bad news is I see a big report on pending home sales today and we're getting no reaction in the home construction group. Um, that tells me that maybe we were priced. A lot of this is already priced in. The other thing is DR Horton had the breakout back here above that August high and could not hold it and lost it on some increasing volume. So I see a couple of things just to be a little cautious about here. I think we could maybe make a move back down to test this breakout area. So I think 42 and a half to 43, two and three quarters is a possibility. And I would probably use that 47 now as my current resistance. That's the trading range I would look for. So if you're a fan of DR Horton, I think uh, take a look also at this trend line. I think we're going to see that it connects at a pretty important level um, right there. So right at about the price support I drew, you've also got trend line support. Um, I think you get back down closer to 43, 42, 75, and that's where I think your reward to risk sets up beautifully for the stock. So I could keep a very tight stop if I'm wrong. If I'm right, I'm gonna make 10% or more, maybe 11, 12%. So that's what I try to do from a trading, short-term trading perspective. Uh, so I would wait. I would wait and take advantage if you get a little bit more of a drop, another three percent or so off this stock. I think that would be a great setup. Okay, that does complete the ten and ten. Here are the symbols that we just went over. I will have these up in the Market Watchers live chart list after the show. Just go to the Articles Blogs tab, click on Market Watchers Live Blog. And the link to that live chart list is right there at the top. And of course, it gives you access to all of the Market Watchers live recaps. All right, time to go into our final market update. 
thought, saw one piece of very interesting uh, data. But first, let's go ahead and, and go through what's going on at this point. As you can see, most of the market's trying to make their way back into positive territory with the Dow very, very close, down only eight and a half points currently. S&P 500 down 4.33 points. NASDAQ trying to make its way back up, but notice we haven't even come close to you know, that opening intraday low uh, that we had on that gap, still trying to make our way up, but you can see we did better have been doing better as far as the Dow and the S&P 500 are concerned, but NASDAQ uh, certainly seeing some downside pressure going on. This was the interesting piece of data that I noticed when I was on the, um, on the dashboard, and that is that the NYSE is currently, of those major market indexes that we follow, the only one in positive territory right now and getting ready to channel, challenge yesterday's highs. So very interesting to see the overall broad market in the NYSE uh, performing far better than we're seeing in these uh, large cap indexes. But Russell 2000 still not in positive territory. So we really can't make a huge conclusion as far as small caps go as Russell 2000 is lower, currently down nine points. TSX, down slightly, uh, slightly volatile day, I'd have to say here with an intraday low uh, hitting right around 16,540. TNX down currently uh, 2.511%. Volatility index mostly unchanged, reading at 1317. UUP, big gap down, tried to make uh, take back some of those losses, but is right back down there testing the intraday low at 2616. GLD gold is rising right now. Uh, does look like it hit an intraday high, but up 30 cents, 121.13. USO traveling mostly sideways, but in positive territory at 13.30. TLT uh, forming somewhat of a flag formation here, consolidating sideways after a nice bump on the open. As far as the sectors go, just a quick look. Uh, we can see, actually make sure that is completely up to date. There we go. Utilities is the winner today, up 1%. Big loser, comm services sector, down 2 and 2.8%. So down over 2.25% right now for the comm services sector. And that's all I have for the final market update. I'm going to pass it back to you, Tom. All right. Yeah, I wanted to just take a look uh, at the industry groups. And within consumer discretionary, I actually pulled up a uh, one week, just looking back at the last week. Now, right now, you can see toys, the best performing area of consumer discretionary, up 1.77%. I wrote about this in my blog this morning under the sector industry watch area and talked a little bit about the toys. And uh, at this point, the toys actually were up 6% over the last week because if we look at yesterday's close and go back five days, you can see that we've had a really nice move. Volume starting to pick up, but I see some positives. Um, I, if I think about it, I'll ask uh, Bruce when he comes in on Thursday, Bruce Fraser, about this from a why coffee in perspective. But after uh, moving down in December and then starting to turn back up, you can see a big gap down on heavy volume here. But we don't go below that prior low. We instead absorb those shares and make another push to the upside. Look at all the volume here. And then as we start these different sell offs, the volume. Uh, really starts to fall off, whereas during the moves to the upside, the volume has been heavier. So I'm just waiting for confirmation on a breakout above 850. I think it's too early to um, assume that toys are going to make this breakout, but this has been the best area of consumer discretionary for the last week. The volume's coming in. We're getting closer to overhead resistance. And so I think this is an area maybe to keep an eye on as we go forward. So toys, I think, are an area... Uh, that I would continue to watch closely. All right, uh, it is time for the final segment. This is intermarket analysis. And what I'm gonna do is just go through some charts for you. Uh, I'm gonna start off with some of the intermarket um, uh, relationships that I like to follow. Now, if you're not familiar with intermarket analysis, all you're doing really is you're taking one area of the market and you're comparing it to another area. So, for instance, this first chart is consumer discretionary versus consumer staples. So I'm not looking just at what consumer discretionary is doing. If I wanted to do that, I would just simply do the XLY. And this is what consumer discretionary is doing. And if I wanted to know what consumer staples was doing, there, 
looks like they're doing the same thing, right? They're both going up. Well, not so much. And I think if you go back and you look at this relative chart, you'll see some interesting um, developments throughout the, the period. First of all, since 2009, this ratio has been going higher for the most part. When it goes lower, I want you to look at what happens to the S&P 500. Here, we struggled in the fourth quarter. Money was rotating away from consumer discretionary and into consumer staples. That's normal, by the way. When the stock market gets hit, you tend to lose more in the more aggressive areas of the market. Those are the ones that lead on the way up. So when you start to see more concerted selling to the downside, you tend to see that weakness. Same thing back here, end of 15 into 2016. You can see the S&P 500 struggled during this period. Here was an exception, 2014, we struggled on the ratio, but we kept going higher. But if you go back and look at other periods, 2011, same thing, 2010, same thing. And so down at the bottom, here's a correlation that tells you that the relationship between consumer discretionary and consumer staples, the XLY to the X versus the XLP, is very highly positively correlated to the direction of the S&P 500. So why is that worthwhile noting? Well, when the S&P 500 is rallying, one thing I want to see is that this ratio is rallying with it. And we are doing that in 2019. So I find this to be a very bullish chart. Transports, utilities, same theory, um, taking the transports versus utilities. Transports are more economically sensitive. They tend to move higher when our, when our economy is strengthening. And utilities, when our economy is strengthening, tend to struggle. Uh, money tends to rotate away from fixed income and more into uh, you know, areas of the market where you get some uh, capital appreciation. Now, I don't think the relationship here is quite as strong but I will say this, when you see the relate when you see the, the weakness in transports versus utilities, we saw this back in 2011, 2012. We saw it 2014 through 2016. We saw it throughout 2018, 2019. Look at when we've run into difficulties on the S&P 500. Right here, when we've been downtrending. Right here, when we've been downtrending on that ratio. And over here, we went higher, but it was a struggle while we were downtrending. When this ratio is moving up, the market explodes. So I am watching this, and I've posted this also in my blog. You can go back and take a look at my blog. I don't remember if it was today or yesterday. Um, but when we broke this, this, uh, uh, these, these relative highs in 2016 and took off, that's when the S&P took off, really took off. Now we're looking to do the same thing. You might say, well, we already took off. Well, actually, we're just getting back to where we were in September and October. Um, yeah, we did just break out the all-time highs, but if you had you know, hibernated for six or seven months and came back and looked at the market, you'd say, well, we haven't gone anywhere. So if we make this breakout, I think this rally extends, and I think we could be looking at some very significant gains. So I think this is another relative chart to pay close attention to. The NASDAQ versus the S&P 500, I mean, I think this one goes without saying. The NASDAQ has a lot of those high-flying technology companies that are a big part of the weighting of the NASDAQ index. So anytime the market's going up, you want to see the NASDAQ outperform. Look at the, the uh, correlation here. Very positive for the most part. Next up, Russell 2000. Now, when I go to the bottom here, I see a little bit less correlation. In other words, we're kind of going back and forth. Um, but this is a, an area where we have seen some strength coming in. You can see the relative strength on the Russell 2000 bottomed right at about 0 .0, or excuse me, 0 0.53. You can come over here and look at that relationship. Um, that was back in 2009. In 2016, we bottomed between 0 0.52 and 0 0.53. We're currently at 0 0.54. This is an area where throughout this bull market, we've seen relative strength from small caps. And I pointed out the top of the show where we, the last, you know, I don't know, a uh, few months, well, excuse me, a few weeks, you can see that in March we bottomed and we tried to start to strengthen, pulled back. And now over the last week or so, we've got this little bit of a turn back to the upside. This would be bullish for the market if small caps could continue to perform well. I think if we can get through 1600, we're likely to see that. The banks relative to real estate investment trusts. 
Why is this important? Well, real estate investment trusts are seen as a little bit more defensive, more income-oriented investments. The banks also can be somewhat income-oriented, but think about what our economy desperately requires. It requires credit. If credit falls apart, if the banks start to lose money, especially if their loans start going bad, the economy starts to falter, banks, and I audited banks when I was in public accounting, so I know this for a fact, banks will get much more conservative when they start losing money on loans. They would rather invest in federal home loan bank securities or something where they know they don't have any risk. Many bankers, I know, you know, I think Wall Street, some of the big banks maybe give uh, some of the other regional and smaller banks a bad name, but many of these banks, especially the ones I audited, they tend to be very conservative. And when the economy starts to roll over a little bit, uh, banks tend to get very, their investments are close to the vest. They tend to not take too many chances. And so you have to understand again, similar to that transport versus utilities chart, that when you go through a period where banks are underperforming the REITs, chances are you're not going to be doing too much in the stock market. And you can see 2018. Here was that January top. We did go up one more time on the S&P 500, couldn't sustain it, and then rolled back. Now we're rolling back to the upside, and banks versus REITs have moved back above that 20-day moving average. I think that's an important thing to watch because if we continue to move higher on the banks, I think what this tells us, if we go back and look at when the S&P 500 has, has, it, has had its biggest moves, it's been when we are seeing significant outperformance of banks relative to REITs. That's when we get on these unabated moves to the upside. Think about it. If the banks are doing well, they're willing to lend. And if they're willing to lend, it's easier for companies to expand. So I like what I'm seeing on this chart. Next up, uh, I've shown this many times before, but looking at the U.S. Treasury yields versus the German Treasury yields is another form of intermarket analysis. We're looking at seeing what the Treasuries are doing here, Treasury yields are doing here in the U.S. versus Germany. There is a pretty good correlation between the markets in the U.S. and Germany. I've noted that when you look at the S&P 500 and compare it to the German DAX, that one of the tightest positive correlations between U.S. markets and foreign markets are, it, well, is with the U.S. versus Germany. Same thing goes for these yields. When the dollar, uh, or excuse me, when the 10-year the Treasury yield here in the U.S. is rising faster than the yield in Germany, it's telling us that our economy is strengthening faster than Germany. Why is that important? Well, back when I was in college, it wasn't that important because we didn't have a, as much global of a global economy. So I always learned that if interest rates were going up in the U.S., that would strengthen the dollar. Well, it's not so much that anymore. It's really the relationship of yields in the U.S. versus yields around the world. It's a relative strength deal now. It's not just what's going on in the U.S. So if you look at this um, move to the upside in Treasury yields here in the U.S. since the end of 2011, that just about coincided with the bottom in the dollar. And look at this trend line on the dollar moving higher. Look at the correlation between the direction of the U.S. Treasury yield versus Germany and the direction of the dollar. I think it's almost unmistakable here that we have a darn uh, you know, strong positive correlation here. And I don't see anything stopping just yet. We have seen over the last six months a little bit of a pullback, but we saw that back in 2017. We saw it in 2015, 2013. Uh, it's not unusual to have pullbacks. You don't go up every day, every week, every month. But the overall uptrend's in play. And if we start to turn higher here again, look for a stronger dollar. So what does that impact? Well, recently I talked about the dollar and how it impacts materials and energy on a relative basis. The last bull market we had, you can see materials were leading the S&P 500. The dollar was declining. This bull market, the dollar's been rising, and so materials are not participating. That's uh, pretty important, and you can see that we have mostly an inverse correlation here. So that when the dollar is going in one direction, the relative performance of materials is going in the other direction. 
Very important to note, because if you think the dollar is going higher, probably want to stay away from materials or certainly you want to underweight them. Same thing goes for energy. So with energy, here you go. You've got the relationship of energy versus the S&P 500 rising in the last bear market or excuse me, last bull market when the dollar was declining. But now that the dollar is on the move to the upside, energy continues to weaken. And I know I've gotten into some of these discussions on Market Watchers Live and in my blogs, and I'll say, hey, energy is looking pretty good, starting to strengthen. But I always bring up the relative strength and say, the only way that this group, or I shouldn't say the only way, but chances are we are not going to continue this move to the upside. We're not going to see leadership for an extended period of time in energy and, and materials unless we start to see this dollar roll over. And right now I'm seeing no signs of that. I think the dollar is doing exactly what it did back in the late 90s. Um, we had a strengthening economy better than other parts of the world and the US stock market far exceeded other areas of the world. I think that's what we're in right now. And based on all of these charts, um, that's what leads me to that conclusion. So let's pull up a summary on the intermarket uh, analysis, these charts I just went over. I don't know if you use all of them or some of them, but what I can do, these are in a chart list. So I'm gonna send these to Aaron, and Aaron, if you want, you can post these into the Market Watchers Live blog this evening. And or this afternoon, and anybody who wants to go in and download these into your own account, again, if you've got if you're a uh, extra member and you have multiple chart lists, you can just download these right in and keep these and monitor them. It's really important as you go forward. Yeah, absolutely. I will put the link uh, to all of those in there. Awesome. Do you uh, follow you know much intermarket? And by the way, I get a lot of this from John Murphy. I owe him a lot of credit. I don't want anybody here thinking I'm a genius. Um, John Murphy is the genius. I just uh, followed what he's done and I maybe expanded on a little bit, but these things make sense to me. And no, absolutely. It, now, it, you know, I don't particularly have like these charts in, in my lists, uh, mainly because I have people like John Murphy and you, Tom, that I can go read the blogs and keep up to date on it. So uh, I think that information is invaluable, but uh, I appreciate the fact that, that you two talk about it a lot. Yeah, I mean, the, the chart that I showed on the XLE versus the S&P 500, I know it's not up on your screen right now. You can look at it later. But it is setting a new multi-year, eight-year relative low right now. Crude oil prices are up near their highs. And I don't think a lot of people, and energy's gone higher. The XLE's gone higher. But I don't think people realize that it's underperforming the S&P 500. So, you know, if you're just looking to make money, the XLE, you can do it. But if you're looking to outperform the benchmark S&P 500, I think the XLE is not the way to go. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh, so here we are coming down to yet the end of another day and actually the end of a calendar month. This is it for April. So we're going to start off in May. And by the way, historically, the market does like May. You know, I was just going to ask you that. <laughs> well, you get a lot of folks saying go away in May. I completely disagree with them. There are pockets of time in May. You got to be a little careful. But I think the S&P 500 has an annualized return of like 20 12% since 1950 in May, which is better than the 9% throughout the year. So I don't know why anybody would want to go away. Wow. And I'm, I'm also noting that the NYSE is now up over 25 points, 0.2%. Everything else is in the red. Yep. Uh, market is very resilient. And this is what happens when we get a low volatility index reading. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, I do want to thank all of you for being with us today. Please remember to complete the survey as you exit. It's located below your video player. We do love to get your feedback, hear what you think of Market Watchers Live, so please uh, complete that if you don't mind. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Tuesday afternoon, everybody, and hopefully we will see you back here tomorrow. Happy trading, everyone.